Thank you for tuning in to the ETH podcast. I'm your host, Jennifer Kakshuri, and we're reaching for the stars in this episode again. My name is Didier Colo. Uh, I'm professor of physics, and I will start at ETH on the 1st of September. At the same time, I will also um, be professor in Cambridge, Cambridge University in UK, and I will share my time between Cambridge and Zurich. We want to speak about Cambridge and Zurich later on quickly. You and Michel Mayor, you won the Nobel Prize for Physics two years ago. Usually retired people win it or get it. Why are you still working? Well, um, <laughs> well you know what happened is there is quite a lot of time between the work you're doing and, and the time you get the Nobel Prize usually is 20 to 30 years. I, I got, if you want to say, the chance I'm not sure it was a chance because it was quite um, quite stressful at that time to make a discovery very young in my career, uh, something quite significant. And uh, and it turns out that the time you got such a price, I'm still into business. So I'm trying to make, to make something uh, out of this visibility I have right now. So you got the Nobel Prize in 2019 for a discovery that you made in 1995. Can you take us back to that moment of the discovery in 1995, yeah. <laughs> your memories? Oh, yeah, yeah, that was, I mean, that, I was at the end of my PhD at that time. And I, in my PhD, I essentially spent a lot of time building an, a, a new techniques uh, and working with a new machine uh, that is able to make measurements of the speed. We call that the radial velocity of stars. And they can do that with an extreme accuracy. So to reach that level, there's a lot of tricks, both hardware in the build-up of the machine and also in the software to analyze the data. And that was my PhD. And um, at the end of my PhD, we, we started the program that was for looking for planet. So why looking for planet with this machine? It's because we, you want to detect small motion of the speed of the star. And if you find these small, tiny motions, it tells you that there is a planet orbiting. Well, the expectation at that time was it would take years to do that. So I was not supposed to find a planet at all. I was supposed to just start the program. And it turns out that during the early start of the program, I picked up a strange signal, something awkward in the data on one star, which is called 51 Peg, 51 Pegasi. And it turns out that I get a bit obsessed, but nothing went the way I was expected because I saw the, the value of the speed of that star changing one day after another one or one night after another one. And it turns out that the only way, the only way I could make sense to this data was to consider that there is a planet. And, but the planet on that star was really a big shark because it was a planet like Jupiter, but not like our own Jupiter with uh, more than 10 years to go around its star, our sun. This one took only four days. And that's how I think um, we completely changed, in a way, the topic, because we announced in 95 um, that we had detected. Michel Mayor was my supervisor at that time. So he was not there when all this measurement was done. He came back later. He was in sabbatical. He was quite quite, quite shocked. I think when I came to him, I said, look, Michel, I think I, I found a planet. And, uh, and, and then we announced it. And, uh, I think nobody believed us at this time. It took a long time for Where community. were you at that moment? And what went through your mind? Did you think you were crazy or you thought someone was playing a trick or? Well, I, actually the measurements happened in the south of France in an observatory called Observatoire de Haute-Provence. This is where we had the equipment. So I used to go there every one or two months for a week. And so I was in this observatory making the measurement at night. And, uh, and for me, that was really a lot of stress because that was the end of my PhD and I was not expected at all such a behavior. I was expecting all the stars to be maybe gently varying or maybe having no clear variations at that scale because I was only comparing one night after the other one. Uh, and I really thought that something was really wrong somewhere in the equipment or in my software. And I got a little bit obsessed because Remember, end of my PhD, I say, well, I mean, this is impossible, that stuff. I have to find out. And I was even a bit ashamed because I didn't want to talk to my supervisor. I said, I cannot talk to my supervisor about that. This is ridiculous. So I have to find the problem. And there is a point when you can't find the problem. You have to realize that there is no problem at all. You just made a big discovery. And that's what happened to me. 
And was it a moment of joy or was it a moment of irritation? Well, I must admit, I never felt really a lot of joy into that because it was so awkward. So I felt puzzled. I felt excited by the discovery, by what I had found. But I felt also scared because I know that was something that nobody would respond positively. And uh, it took a long time for me to really enjoy the discovery because it was difficult. Well, after we announced most of the community were against us, I was very young, very young, so I had my career to build up. For, for my supervisor, that was way easier because he was at the end of his career, so he could really have all the visibility and enjoy it without too much risk. I had to demonstrate that I could really be a researcher, not only with one, one discovery. So, so that took me a long time to establish this kind of strength and, and to see the discovery as really something that I feel a lot of joy. But, but I was not at really at that moment, certainly not for me. And what about when you were in Stockholm and you received the Nobel Prize? Was there more joy then? <laughs> yeah, well, when I got the announcement, I couldn't believe it because Nobel Prize for a physicist, this is you reaching the Pantheon of the God of the physics. And, and you never see yourself like that. I think no one could see himself like that or himself like that. So, so you didn't see it coming? Well, you know, we were aware that we were part of the list, but we were aware almost since the beginning. But, you know, like of a lot of big discoveries, and, and, and if I could say the problem of the Nobel Prize, there is only one, and there is a maximum of three winners every year. And I do think there is way more people that would deserve the Nobel Prize than people that could get it. So whether that would be considered as a major discovery for the physics, that's something I was never so sure about. So when I got the announcement, but I've been informed of all this, I was a little bit on the shock because to me that was as if the reality at that point caught me up. And I said, oh yeah, then this is it. So, so no, we have it. Oh my God, <laughs> this is really what I found. And I was a bit scared, I must say, as well. <laughs> but why scared? Because when you get the Nobel Prize, this is just absolutely crazy. I think the it's not only about your field, it's everybody is watching you. Everybody is expecting you something extraordinary. So everybody is expect that you will you will speak about everything. And in a way, it's some responsibility. And as we, as a researcher, nobody is ready for a Nobel Prize. So when, of course, if you are retired and the end of the career, that may be less relevant. But for somebody like me, uh, that's something that you don't know how to handle it because it's 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 a big gift, but in a way it's a big gift that is hot at the same time. So you have to be careful not to burn your skin with it. And that's a bit the challenge of Nobel Prize. So I think I survived the event. Uh, I know I, I know how to handle it and I have a, a nice program to put forward. So I must say that right now, as of today, I think I enjoy all of it. <laughs> <laughs> For people who don't understand astronomy, like me, how did Michel Mayor and you change astronomy by your discovery in 1995? Well, if you want to make a comparison, it's about the same kind of uh, story that happened way back when, when uh, following, I think, Copernicus, essentially, um, the scientists in this time, we, we really back backwards here and in, in the 15th century, uh, realized that the Earth was not the center of the world and it was just orbiting a star, which is our sun. So what we did is something like that. We just demonstrated that all planet is just one planet amongst many because there are other planets orbiting other stars. So everybody was in a way expecting this, but nobody had demonstrated there would be any. So this is what we did. That's what the, the Nobel Foundation recognized, and they recognize it as we open what's called a new window on the universe. And, uh, and then a lot of people came then after it, because once you have one, everybody realized there must be many. And actually, right now, we have a zillions number of planets orbiting other stars. It's, it's not a question anymore. It's pretty, it's pretty common to find a planet orbiting another star. And how important is the question whether or not there is life on other planets? Well, that's the related question that came right after. And that's something we also realized. I mean, we, we were very proud of having detected the planet, of course, because it was a technical achievement. But we didn't see coming, I think, the emotional related question that comes, oh, 
then if there are planets on other stars, there must be life on this planet on other stars as well. And, and actually, this is a topic which is difficult because it's finding a planet compared to finding life on other stars, it's really easy, I can tell you. But that's a topic that have grown since that time. And that's clear that the discoveries of all this planet on other stars have acted a little bit like a stimulus. Uh, They've pushed a little bit this question further down and people have started to ask this question maybe from different angles. And and then recently we have had significant progress from the chemist or the biologist or biochemist, I don't know what you want to call them, on that topic, what's called the origin of life on on Earth. And there is this great prospect that we're going to uh, look a bit more detail what happened in the past on Mars or maybe on Venus as well. And that is going to come because these space missions which are being planned are happening right now. And this is changing absolutely this question of life in the universe because it's not only you no know, a questions, it's a theme of and we have a series of questions related that we can start answering. Of course, we're not going to answer yes or not about that question. There will be a, a slow process with maybe some, some insight here, maybe some s- small step, but we are clearly moving towards the, the perspective to not only be able to recenter the solar system amongst the many solar systems that exist in the universe, but we're trying to understand life as a universal process in the universe. And that is what we are starting to do now. And what do you think about the press releases of the Pentagon that maybe there are UFOs in the sky? What are in the sky? I mean, it's further than the sky, but what do you believe in the UFOs that, that the newspaper is you know, writing about? <laughs> science is it, it's not a religion, so, so you don't have to believe it or not to believe it. Mm-hmm. It is based on, on facts. So my understanding of this press release that has been done, that there is no clear facts about this, so I would love, I mean, if I, mean, if I see a really uh, an alien and knocking to my door in my office, I would love to have a long chat with this alien. What would you ask the alien? Where are you coming from first? <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. know, we would have to speak the same language. So, so even in a country like Switzerland, not everybody is understanding the language of the other. So, <laughs> so I think that may be a quite of a challenge to understand each other. <laughs> We spoke to a few people now for this series of uh, the stars and the planets to astronomers and most of the people we spoke to had a strong relationship in childhood to, I don't know, Star Trek or to sci-fi literature. How was that with you? Is this something that you enjoyed or still enjoy? Well, I would not qualify myself as a fan of sci-fi, but of course, I think uh, I'm part of this population that had the TV when they were young. And of course, I've seen all the classical series and all the movies about sci-fi. And these are great movies. Whether this has inspired myself, I'm not sure that it's more a global element about uh, knowledge and curiosity that inspire myself. Certainly, when, when, when you see this, this, this Apollo landings and exploration of the solar system, this beautiful picture, the, uh, that is really something that always fascinated me. But I always had a more intellectual approach of the problem. And actually, I think what dragged me down to science is by reading a lot of books, a lot of articles, and just by following the news of the science. And books, f- not literature. You mean science yeah, books, well, physics I'm, I'm, books? One of the very famous books is this book of Carl Sagan, Cosmos, which inspired myself, definitely. And I thought this book is just, just wonderful. I mean, this is Carl Sagan is bringing you into the research by the emotion, which is which is something that was very fascinating to get when 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 in kids, because you get the feeling that science is kind of boring because you see that only the math, you see only the technicalities, but you realize that this is all wrong. This is maybe some way to see it, but actually it's like the paintings. You can see the technicality of the painting, but who cares? What you what you do care about the painting of the art is is what is your connection to the art that you're looking looking at or hearing about the music is exactly the same. So science is exactly the same. So you should not be obsessed on by the technicality, but you should just use the science as an emotional element that it connecting you better to um, anything you want to connect around you, which is the global environments. And and science is bringing you that in a very clever way, based on 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 facts. 
that correspond to very profound knowledge and elements. And that's what I realized when, when I was younger. And I think this is what have dragged me to science as a general topic that I wanted to study. And then I went to physics because when I was young, I, I realized that physics should be the king of the science. And I thought astrophysics would be a cool uh, topic within physics. Well, because I think when you see telescopes, uh, top of the mountain, volcanoes, you see this beautiful site, you see this beautiful equipment. I think it's pretty cool to work in that environment. And I, I, I like the night sky. Mm. I just enjoy it. And the universe is a lab, actually, for an astrophysicist. You encounter the, the Big Bang, the dark matter, the life in the universe, all these big questions. So I thought that would be something that I would certainly enjoy myself to spend my, my life working on it. Here in Zurich, you're going to be building a new center and you'll also be in Cambridge with your other leg, so to speak. How is that going to work? Will you commute or will it be one semester here, one semester there? Yeah, I will try to do long, long periods uh, that because it's easy to be for a given time somewhere. It doesn't prevent to go a little bit back and forth. But I will, I will go very naturally because there are, there are different periods of teaching. And right now, we, we certainly are very familiar with the fact that you don't need to see the people in person every time. There's a lot of communication means that what we already in use before, I think, amongst the astronomers. Because when you have people on the top of the mountain in Chile and you want to have a discussion, so you use Zoom. We have been using all this before the pandemic. So right now, everybody knows these kind of tools. So that would be a mixing of, of working remotely to some extent for just keeping the communication channel and spending half of my time in ATH Zurich and the other half of my time in Cambridge, UK. Here at ETH, you're building a new center to study the origins of life. Will you be able to research yourself anymore or will you just be a manager? No. Oh, my God. I'm not planning to be a manager at all. I think that the center will be self-managed in a way. We will have someone, certainly, that will be an acting manager, but it will not be me. No, I think my role is, first, I will, I will continue to work on the topic that I've already started, which essentially my business is to find the planets and to find how they look like, essentially. But I think I can also, you know, be some kind of a glue or... I always compare science as it's, it's a fantastic uh, orchestra. The problem of the orchestra, especially at ATH, you have... You have an orchestra which is full of first violin and prima donna and singing and there's plenty of people, just extraordinary. So how do you build up something which is not the individual activity of each of them? That's something that together is making the orchestra sound like an orchestra. And that's exactly what I'm trying to do. And I think with my experience and my knowledge now of the field, I can help to do that. So I don't know who I would qualify my, myself, but it's, it, it's a bit like uh, if you compare with, with orchestra, being a maestro in a way. So essentially a maestro doesn't do anything. Wow. But, but Because he doesn't play, really. But he, he's making the play working. <laughs> so I think I will have seen the center successful if I can demonstrate that the center is working without me. And that's exactly what will be the, uh, the objective. So having something which is completely working and operational and in a way will self-constructing its own science and we will attract bright people, young people, and we will hopefully develop this community spirit and common identity that I'm, I'm trying to describe with the comparison with the orchestra. Is this also what, what drew you to Zurich, that you have so many people who play the first violin and who are the prima donna and who are actually soloists but just sort of need to work together? Well, there is various elements that brought me to Zurich. Certainly, I think ATH is certainly one of the institutions that you want to look for that kind of center because you will find what's called a critical mass, so enough people that could really make a difference. So it's quality, if you want, of the people here, combined also with the capability to do it in terms of resource, infrastructure. So that's really a key ingredient, and that was certainly the starting point. But that's not enough. What happened as well is I realized that there were people in this place already, in various departments, that 
they were considering, I think, that topic as a topic worth of research. But they essentially were missing a little bit of something to make it work. And what is what was this something is some kind of a push to say, okay, that's great, Let, let's do it. This is the resource that we will have to start. And this has happened by a long conversation I've had with uh, Joël Mezot. So I explained essentially to Joël Mezot the idea that I had, and I really wanted to develop that center. I thought ATH could be a good place to do that. I would be pleased to bring this kind of idea to execute it in Switzerland, because I was already doing that in Cambridge. And Joël, I think, just loved it. And I thought that is a great idea. And and he made this possible. And I think this is the combination of all of this that is making this center possible. Joël Mezo is the president of the ETH Zurich, and this is common knowledge for you and also for me, but maybe people listening outside of Switzerland just to give an idea. You told us that you work in Cambridge and in Zurich. Will there be a possibility of collaborating? Will Cambridge and ETH Zurich somehow have projects together? That is my ambition, to establish scientific collaborations. The reason why uh, it's my ambition is first, I think, in terms of quality of the research and impact of the research, this university is very similar. So that would be, in terms of intellectual agility, that would be certainly very easy to do. Now, there is also another element which is interesting. I do think that we would benefit in Europe to build up a bit more closer network on some key topic of research. There already is some existing network, but that network doesn't really exist yet at that level, simply because it's easier to travel between UK and Switzerland than to look for collaboration with, with Japan or with, with US. It's not, we do have collaboration, but it's just much farther away. So let's try to build up with the people we have. And we're also looking, also looking for for some place in Germany, there are also some center, an existing center in, in, in Spain, in France. I mean, th that will come along the way. But the idea of this center is to resonate and to be seen as a place willing to work with these other places. And hopefully we should be able to build up a network which is essential for the young researcher. Because these young researcher, they need to have a pathway in, in their career. So they may want to study at one place, and then do a, a, what's called a postdoc in another place, and then they may find a position in a third place. So you need to build up these many different places just to offer the opportunity for, for, for this uh, researcher to just move around and, and to build up a career according to their interests. So we, we, we cannot be alone on that. It's, it will not work. It's, it's a global program. It's a global program. You spoke about Europe, but Cambridge and Switzerland both aren't really in Europe. <laughs> I mean, of course, they are geographically, but they're not part of the... Well, Landa, you enter into the political Europe, this EU, which is... which EU is not Europe. EU is the EU, which is a topic of concern, I think, for Switzerland. And, and we have seen what is happening right now. I think, frankly, I just learned that what is happening right now with the, uh, with the European Research Council program, I think for Switzerland, this is certainly uh, certainly not a good deal what is happening. So, so we have to find ways, and I'm not planning to fix the problem, but at least I will try to use my connection with Cambridge to, to build up some interesting collaboration and maybe some exchange between the two places. When you retire, we can say Didier was a Nobel Prize winner, a manager, a diplomat, and a scientist. <laughs> Which one do you like best? I, I don't know. I'm not sure how to understand the, the word retirement. So you're not ever going to retire, you think? <laughs> you know, when you're a scientist, I don't think you can ever stop. Of course, you will have to give up your tasks, your duties, but but you never stop. I mean, look at all these uh, scientists. They they keep have doing their own, I mean, idea. They, some are writing books and, I mean, some are giving advice. And then, of course, they don't have the action to express responsibility or managerial responsibility, but... You know, science is a way of living in a way. And I, it's all, I always say it's amazing that we got paid for that because I feel like an artist in a way. As I'm, I'm producing my art and I will still doing it until my, my last breath, I guess. Thank you very much, Didier Culo, for being here at the ETH podcast. My name is Jennifer Kakshuri. I produced this podcast together with Tiswachter's Audio Story Lab and with sound designer Luki Fretz. <laughs>